Welcome everyone to this evening's sermon. It's great you can be joining us. Uh, Tonight we're going to be looking at a passage in Haggai chapter 2. This week I've been preparing in Haggai for some youth Bible studies that we'll be doing this term. And there's a lot that I've been seeing here, particularly in this passage in chapter 2, that I think will be really relevant for us and that I've been really blessed by. So please turn there. Haggai chapter 2, we'll read it first and then get into it. Haggai chapter 2 and we'll read verse 1 to 9. Haggai 2. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left among who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look now? Does it seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations will come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Let's pray together. Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, we come before you humbled. How great you are, sovereign in control, ruler of the universe, Lord of all that we know. And we come before you now asking for you to open up our eyes, open up our hearts to your truth, to your word, because we know that we will not see what we need to see unless you work. We need your spirit to work in us now to bring the encouragement that we need, to bring the conviction that we need. I need your spirit to work in me, to speak clearly your word, to speak it with application and with truth and relevance. We need your spirit to have our hearts opened, ready to hear what you have to say. And so we pray that you would come now, send your spirit and work in us and transform us and grow us to be a people that serve you. And we pray all of this in our wonderful Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it's very easy to get discouraged as you serve the Lord. Easy to feel fearful that what you are doing is achieving nothing. Easy to feel as though ministry or a discipling relationship that you're involved in is a waste. To feel useless as you compare the great accomplishments of others to what you are doing. Easy to feel discouraged as churches, ministries or Bible studies around you prosper while yours dwindles. Today, our passage is one that gives courage for the discouraged. It gives hope for the hopeless, strength for the disheartened. It gives restoration for the broken and peace for the fearful. This passage gives a message that we often need to hear as we serve the Lord. It gives one that I often need to hear as I serve the Lord. And it's a message I think we need at the moment as we rebuild life after so much has been put on hold, discouragement is ahead. Disappointments are going to abound and difficulty will always be around the corner as we serve the Lord. And especially in this season, as we come back to services, as ministries resume and the taxing task of rebuilding what we once had begins again. We need this message. Rebuilding is never an easy task. It it has obstacles. It has difficulties. It has disheartening moments. So how do we continue to serve the Lord in times like this? Well, the people that the Lord speaks to here, through the prophet Haggai, 
they were also in a season of rebuilding. And they had a lot of reasons to be discouraged. The people here in our passage, they are rebuilding the temple. And we might think, well, how wonderful. What a wonderful thing. They should have deep joy as they take part in such a glorious project. But it wasn't like this for them. And we see this in the story that leads up to the book of Haggai. We see why. To understand the background and the book of Haggai, we need to go back about 70 years to 586 BC. At this point in, in time, the Babylonians had laid siege on Jerusalem and the, the city fell eventually at their hands. Many people were taken into exile, so they were taken to live uh, in the land of Babylon. And the city was destroyed, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple lay in ruins after the Babylonians had destroyed it. However, about 50 years after this, the Persians come and take over Babylon. And in 538 BC, Cyrus, the king of Persia, he decrees that the Israelites can go back and return to Jerusalem. And they can rebuild the temple, as we read in Ezra chapter 1 and 2. And so in about 537 BC, 537 BC, 50,000, around 50,000 Jews return to Israel to start building the temple. And they do. They start rebuilding it. And after about two years of building, the foundation of the temple is complete. We see this in Ezra Ezra chapter 3. However, it's not long after this, in Ezra 3 and in Ezra 4, we see that the people stop building the temple because opposition comes from the neighboring countries around them because these people fear what will happen in the Jewish people if they complete the temple. And so the building stops. For about 15 years, the building project on the temple is put on hold. But then Haggai comes. Haggai comes in 520 BC. He speaks these messages here that we get in this book. He comes with messages from the Lord to motivate them again to build the temple. In Haggai chapter 1 here, Haggai chapter 1, the Lord gives his first message to the people. And it is to inspire them again, to rebuild, to start building again the temple. Have a look at Haggai chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? It seems when you look at Ezra and this passage here, it seems that because of the opposition that the people had faced 15 years ago, they'd stopped building the temple, they'd become self-consumed and they had built great houses for themselves and they'd left the house of God in ruins for this 15 years. They'd pursued their pleasures, pursued their pursuits and what they desired and they had neglected prioritizing God and serving Him and seeking for His presence to be among them as they built the temple. And so the Lord commands them here. He commands them to build his house again. He says it there in Haggai chapter 1, verse 7 to 8. He commands them to build the temple. And then we see at the end of chapter 1, Haggai chapter 1, verse 12 to 15, we see that the people obey and they start building the temple. And this brings us now to our passage in chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. The people have been building the temple again now for about a month, we see. They've been building for about a month And it seems they face great discouragement. The work of building has come to a halt. The Lord through Haggai, he needs to encourage them again and he needs to tell them to work. He has to tell them to be strong, to serve and continue, even in these discouragements. And this is the first thing we see here in this passage here, that there are discouragements in serving the Lord. We see this in verse 1 to 3. There are discouragements in serving the Lord. Have a look at verse 1. It says, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Now, this is the second time that Haggai speaks a message from the Lord in this book. And in in our calendar, it's October 17th, 520 BC. The Jewish calendar, in the Jewish calendar, it's the 21st day of the seventh month. This would have been the second last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so tomorrow, the 22nd day of the month, would have, been, would have been the last day and a solemn day of rest for the Israelites. And we also see, if you look back in Leviticus, we see that this month had other feasts that the Israelites would have been t- 
taking a part of. And this would have added to the days that they wouldn't have been able to work during this month. This would have slowed their progress in building the temple. And it would have been very discouraging because they wouldn't have seen much progress happen. Also, they would have been disheartened in this time of feasts because they wouldn't have had much to celebrate in the feasts. Normally, this feast that they were taking a part of would celebrate the harvest and the fruits that God had given. And it would be a time of great joy for them. But because of their sin, because they had prioritized their own houses and their own well-being over the work of the Lord, we see in Haggai 1 verse 9 to 11 that the Lord had brought drought and famine. And so they would have had very little to celebrate this feast with. And along with these discouragements was the difficult task of cleaning up and preparing the temple ready to, ready to be rebuilt again. We need to realize the temple was a 70-year-old ruin. A 70-year-old ruin. The strength of the different parts that still remained would have had to be checked. The foundation that had been built 15 years earlier would have had to be checked for its strength. Rubble may still need clearing. Stones would have needed redressing and reshaping. Materials would have needed gathering. And this would have been such a taxing task on them, just to get the temple ready to be rebuilt. When I used to do carpentry work, sometimes I would often, if we had to do reno work, that would be the time when you'd dread it the most. Because if you know anything about renovations, you're working with old materials, and you're also working with things and with materials and with work that may not have been done right in the first place. And that can make it more difficult to build and work with. Sometimes it's just easier to start fresh than work with something that's old and hasn't been done right in the first place. And as the Israelites rebuild the temple, it's more like renovation work for them. They don't even have a good shell to work from, though. They have a 70-year-old pile of rubble. They have a 15-year-old foundation that's been laid, And they need to reno this back into the glorious house of the Lord. That's what they're working with. So there's a lot of discouragement. And there's further discouragement too, because these people are beginning to see that this temple they're working on, it's nothing, absolutely nothing compared to the temple that Solomon had built years ago, 70 years ago. Have a look at verses 2 to 3. Haggai 2, uh, verses 2 to 3. It says, Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look now? Does it not seem like nothing? The Lord here, he speaks to the leaders of Israel and to the people of Israel, and he speaks because he knows They're discouraged. As they look at the current temple, they're discouraged because it is nothing, absolutely nothing compared to the temple that Solomon had built in his day. Solomon's temple was full of glory, full of honor and beauty. It had strong pillars, grand stones, fine curtains. It was covered in gold, decorated with precious stones. It was filled with the Ark of the Covenant and other glorious things as well. And some of those present now in Haggai's day, they may have been over 70, and they may be able to remember the former temple in all its glory. They may have even had some exaggerated childhood memories of the temple and think it was greater than what it really was, and they may have been now speaking about that. And this would have weakened the motivation for those building the temple now in this day. It would have weakened their motivation as they spoke of the glory of the former temple. And also now, in Haggai's day, they don't have the craftsmen, as many skilled craftsmen as they need. They don't have the gold and the riches that they had in Solomon's day to build this temple. So the people here we can see, through all of this, they're facing a lot of discouragement as they come to building the temple. There is a lot of discouragement. And so I want us to see two lessons from these beginning verses. Two lessons that we need to remember in times of discouragement, because they will come as we're serving the Lord. The first lesson we need to remember is don't be discouraged though the progress is slow and though what you do seems insignificant. 
Don't be discouraged. Though the progress is slow, and though it seems that what you're doing is insignificant. The Israelites, they probably didn't see a lot of progress in this first month when they've been building. As we've been saying, they, they've had Sabbath days, they've had festivals, and they've had all the preliminary work of just getting the temple ready to be built. And so it wouldn't have looked like they've made much progress. It wouldn't have looked like they've done much. And they may have been thinking, they may have been thinking, what's the point? It's a waste. Are we even going to get anywhere with this? Is there any point? And serving God can be similar. It's a slow work as we serve the Lord, with often very little to show for our efforts. It's often like this. It's, like, it's been like this in history for missionaries, for many in the past. William Carey, one missionary, he served for seven years in China before his first convert was baptized. Adoniram Judson, another missionary to Burma, he shared the gospel for six years before someone believed. Six years before he saw someone believed. Progress can be slow as we serve the Lord, but slow progress should not discourage us. I sort of think of it like, build, uh, like building something or like growing a fruit tree. It can take many years to grow that fruit tree before it bears fruit. It can take a lot of caring, a lot of work, a lot of pruning, fertilizing, a lot of watering. And it can feel like it's a waste. Is it ever going to bear fruit? Is there any point? It takes a lot of patience. And though we may at times feel discouraged in ministry or as we're serving and that what we're doing is insignificant, we are not to give up. We are to continue faithfully serving God because God grows the fruit and the fruit that God grows in our service will be great. And he can do that. So that's the first lesson. In discouragement, we need to remember, don't be discouraged though the progress is slow and though your service may seem insignificant. The second lesson here, and the, other, the final lesson here, in our discouragements, we need to not fall into the trap of comparing. Don't fall into the trap of comparing. This is a very big one. It's deadly. It will hinder our service for the Lord. The Israelites here, they were comparing back to the former temple. And it was discouraging them as they looked at the present temple and what they had ahead of them. And there is often a temptation in churches, in ministries, to look back at the glory days. And this can be really dangerous. Matthew Henry, he says about this, it is sometimes the fault of old people to discourage the services of the present age by crying up too much the performance and attainments of the former age. We need to watch out that we don't look at the past and then get discouraged because for some reason the church or this ministry is no longer like that now. We need to watch out for this. God is, God is doing a different work now and he knows what he's doing. We need to be careful of comparing to the past. But also we need to, need to be careful about comparing to the present and to those around us right now. This is something we too quickly do. Do you pour yourself into serving the Lord in some way and then you look at the great accomplishment that someone else made in serving the Lord and, and then you get discouraged and you think, what's the point? What's the point? Do you get discouraged as you look around at other churches maybe? As you see other churches thriving? As you see ministries thriving? Do you get discouraged in your small ministry that you might be involved in? Or with your small Bible study? or with your constant evangelistic efforts that seem to bear such little fruit, you need to stop comparing. You need to stop comparing. We need to hear this. We need to stop comparing because from what I hear, this church has had glory days. And so we need to hear this because we've had glory days in this church, but also we're surrounded by many churches that are booming. And this can be the perfect fuel for discouragement. We will all, always feel disheartened. We will feel like quitting if we keep on comparing. But in that moment, when discouragement comes, in that moment, you need to realize that the worth of what you do is not measured by comparing to what others do. It's measured by whether it lines up with what God desires and whether it's seeking and pursuing His glory. That's what matters. 
Too many people, they look at others and they think, I can't add any more to God's work. Look at how great they are. Look at what they've done. I can't do any more. And so they give up. But we need to realize that God is pleased if we sincerely serve Him, not if we match the abilities of those around us. That's what pleases God. If we sincerely serve Him, not if we match and compete with everyone around us. As Joel Beakey says, he says this, I think is quite helpful. He says, There's no better service that we can render to the Lord than being faithful to what He has called us and enabled us to do by the help of His Spirit. All service that is rendered in faithful obedience is pleasing to Him. Well, we see here in these beginning verses, in the background to this book, Haggai, there, there were a lot of discouragements, weren't there, for the Israelites. We can face a lot of discouragements too. And they needed a push. And, and we need a push as well. And that's what we get in the rest of the passage here. So we come now to the, the second big point in the passage. We've seen that there are discouragements in serving the Lord. Verses 1 to 3. Here we see that we need to serve with courage in the discouragements. Verse 4 to 5. Have a look. Verse 4 to 5. Haggai chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. But now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you. When you came out of Egypt and my spirit remains among you, do not fear. There are three amazing calls here that the Lord gives to the Israelites to urge them on to serve with courage. They're amazing. Let's see them. The first one here we see in verse 4 is to be strong. He says it three times in verse 4. Be strong. God knows that the Israelites will be discouraged in their efforts. And so he says, be strong. Be strong. Don't become disheartened. Do not give up. Be strong. Also, the Lord says, work. Verse 4. Work. Though discouragement may come in serving God, though you may feel useless in that, the Lord says, work. Serve him. Keep on going. Keep on serving. Keep on working. He's saying here to the Israelites, restore the temple. Seek for God's glory to be shown. Seek for my presence to be with you. Work. Keep on. And he gives one final command in verse 5. He says, do not fear, right at the end of verse 5. Do not fear. The people would have been fearful that they may not see the temple restored. It just seemed like such a great task. They would have been fearful that they may not enjoy God's presence again, which the temple signified. But the Lord says, do not fear. And so if you are discouraged, if you are discouraged, God says here to you, he says, be strong, work, serve me, and do not fear. But you need to notice something else in these verses. Notice that God doesn't just call them and urge them to do these things to motivate him to serve him. He doesn't just command them to do these things and give commands in our discouragement. No, mingled through these commands here, we see our wonderful truths and promises that will enable them to be strong and work and not fear. This is how God always works. He makes wonderful promises. He gives wonderful truth to enable and motivate in us the things that he wants us to do. That's how he always works. God doesn't abandon the people here after telling them to just build the temple. No, he helps them along the way. And he wants to do the same with us and help us along the way as we seek to serve him. Which brings us to the third point here in the passage. Why can we be strong, not fear? Why can we serve the Lord with courage and work for him? Well, we see why in verses 4 to 9. What gives them the courage here to serve the Lord despite the discouragement they face? Well, there are two things here in the rest of this passage. Two things, two reasons that show why they can serve the Lord with courage. It's God's presence and it's the powerful future work that God will do. 
So firstly, let's look at the first one. Why should we be strong and work and not fear in discouragements? Well, it's because the Lord is with us. Verse five, four to five say this. Look at, look at them again from a different angle. We looked at the commands in those verses. Now look at this promise and this wonderful truth in these verses. Verse four to five says, Being, um, but now, verse four, sorry, but now be strong. O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. You see it again and again here. The Lord is with them. He wants them to know this. He says, yes, he says, be strong and work. Why? For I am with you. The presence of God here should bring a determination to serve him, even though they are disheartened. And verse 5 shows that God's presence is confirmed by the covenant that he made to be with them. And God's presence is confirmed because he says, my spirit remains among you in verse 5. God has promised to be with his people and he still is. That's what he's trying to say. He still is with them. And we see this all through Israel's history. God's presence has always been with them. A couple of uh, snippets to show this. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. He says, be strong, similar to this verse here. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Joshua as well, 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is what we need to hear in discouragement. As we're serving the Lord, we need to hear the promise, God is with you. The Lord Almighty is with you. Yahweh is with you. I so often need to hear this as I serve. I so often need to hear that God is with me And and even the people here in Haggai, they needed to hear this again and again. You see that the Lord has already said it in verse 13 of chapter 1. He said in verse 13, I am with you, declares the Lord. And here a month later in chapter 2, this same message comes again to them. I am with you. They need to keep hearing it. And we do too. For me, I often get this reminder that God is with me from Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20, where Jesus gives that great command to work and make disciples, but he gives a wonderful promise with it, doesn't he? He says at the end, surely I am with you to the end of the age. God is with us. That's why we can go and do this great work and serve him and make disciples. But I ask a question here, as I was thinking about this, I ask the question, how does knowing God is with us help us serve and overcome discouragement? Because I think sometimes we just know the truth of God is with us, but it doesn't seem that incredible. It doesn't feel like it makes any difference knowing that God is with us. How does knowing and having God with us help us serve and overcome discouragement? Well, a few reasons. The first one, because with God's presence comes God's power. With God's presence comes God's power. Haggai 2 is full of this from the rest of the verses that we're about to see. We'll we'll see it in a moment. But also, back to the Great Commission. If you remember, at the beginning of the Great Commission, Jesus says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he says, therefore go. And then at the end, he promises, surely I am with you. So there in the Great Commission, we get the promise that the one who has all authority is with you. The power of the one who is with us makes that such a comfort. But why does the power of someone, someone's presence, why does the power of God being with us make his presence more wonderful? Well, I, I think of it like this to help me understand it. I think of it like this. I remember as a kid, as a kid when I would have to sometimes go through a walk through some sketchy areas in Campbelltown where I grew up and there were some Dangerous people, likely dangerous people around at times. And as I went through those areas, I would feel so much more safe and secure and comforted if I had a a strong, powerful 
dog with me that I was walking or if I had a strong and powerful person with me. I wouldn't feel very safe and comforted if I just had some little weak, fluffy dog with me or my little sister. It wouldn't have brought much comfort to me. It wouldn't have helped me feel safe. But to have someone powerful with me, that was different. That was so different. The power of someone, and the, of the person who is with us, can bring so much comfort. And this is why God's presence is amazing, because He is powerful. He is the Lord Almighty, our passage says, which we're going to look at soon. He is all-powerful, all-sovereign, and He is good. He is for us, not against us, and He is with us. We're going to see more of this soon, His power. But that's what makes it so amazing to have God with us, because of His power. So back to that question, how does, how does knowing God's presence, how does having God's presence help us overcome discouragement and help us serve? Well, it's because with his presence comes his power. But also, a second point, it's because God's presence is a comfort to us because he will enable us to serve him and not fall in discouragement. He helps us in our discouragement. Isaiah 41 verse 10 shows this. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will, I will uphold you with my righteous hand. That's why knowing that God is with us can help us serve and overcome discouragement because he enables us to serve him and he helps us in discouragement. And how does he do that? How does he help us? Well, Haggai chapter 1 verse 14 uh, gives us a hint. There it showed how God, Haggai 1 verse 14 showed how God stirred up the people to build again the temple. He stirred up the people's spirit to be able to build the temple and enable service to him. And that's how he helps us. That's how having God with us helps us to serve him and overcome discouragement because he works in us and stirs up our spirit by His Spirit at work in us. And so we must pray for God's Spirit to enable and strengthen us in His service. That's why it's so good to have God with us, because He does that in us and strengthens us. And therefore as well, we need to realize that as we serve God because of this, it is never an insignificant thing. God is working in us by His Spirit to strengthen our service so we should never think that what we are doing is insignificant because God's working in us by His Spirit to bring that about. We should never think our service is insignificant. Well, back, back to that bigger question that we're looking at here in uh, this point. Why should we be strong? Why should we work and not fear in discouragements? We've seen already because God is with us. That's why we can have courage in discouragements. And continue to serve because God is with us. And then the second and final point, it's because the Lord powerfully controls all things and he makes our work, what we have done, glorious. We see this in verses 6 to 9. Have a look firstly at verses 6 to 7. Verse 6 of Haggai 2 says, This is what the Lord Almighty says, In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. Here God gives the people hope. Because of the powerful future work that he will do, he gives them hope. He's going to return glory to the temple, return glory to his house by shaking the heavens, and the sea, the earth, the land, and the nations to bring treasures in from them into the temple. And how can he do this? Well, verse 6 and 7 begin with this phrase referring to God as the Lord Almighty or the Lord of hosts. It's said four it's actually said five times, five times in verses 6 to 9. And it's said 14 times throughout the book of Haggai. The Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. And it shows it's a phrase that shows his sovereignty. It's a phrase that shows his power that he is able to cause people to act, we see in chapter 1, 14, 2 verse 4, that he's able to control people's possessions, that he's able to rule nations, that he's able to control creation. 
It's one that shows his power over the universe and that he is the ruler of all and that he rules heavenly armies. He is the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. And this surely confirms that he can bring these treasures into his house. He can shake the earth and shake the nations to do what he wants them to do. And also verse 8 shows this power and shows why he can fill the temple and why he can turn their work that may seem small on the temple and why he can make it glorious and wonderful. Because verse 8 says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. God can bring in these treasures. He can bring in these possessions from all nations. Why? Because all of it's his. It's all his. Do you view your possessions like that? Do you see everything as his? Everything that you own as his and for his glory? And do you offer them to him? Do you offer everything you have to him and say, God, it's yours, do as you please with these things, with this money, with this possession, with this house? Do you say that? Or do you misuse them and prioritize your kingdom? Do you prioritize your penalted houses as Haggai chapter 1 said, rather than prioritize God's presence and serving Him. Ask yourself that. Because all is God's. All is His. And this shows, though, why as well He can fill the temple with glory. But a question, it came to me here as I was thinking on these verses, a question came to me, and hopefully you might be thinking the same one as you read these verses. When is this going to happen? As you look at verse 6 to 9, when is this going to happen? When will the treasures from all nations fill the temple? And when will verse 9 happen, which we haven't read yet? I'll read it. When will verse 9 happen? And I'll I'll read it in the ESV this time. It gets the translation a bit clearer. It says there, verse 9, The latter glory of this house shall be greater than former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. When will this happen? When will all these things happen? Well, Haggai in his eyes thought this would all physically happen. But God had something more glorious that he was doing. In part, this was fulfilled physically. But there is still a fuller fulfillment to come, as there always is with prophecy. It's often like this. These things happened in a small way. These things were fulfilled in a small way, even when the opponents of the temple and the building of the temple actually end up having to fund it in Ezra 6. And even in Jesus' day, it seemed like the temple was magnificent because of maybe Herod and others who added to it. But was this physical temple greater in glory than the one of Solomon's day, which was richly lavished and had the Ark of the Covenant and so many other great things? Well, no, I think these verses point to the spiritual reality of the temple as being greater. The latter glory of this temple will be greater because of three wonderful spiritual realities that the temple points forward to. That's why it's greater. The temple is all about the presence of the Lord, having God's presence among the people. We know that. And these three things that we're about to to see quickly, they are the fulfillment of God's glorious presence with his people. They are the fulfillment of God's temple and what it's pointing to. What are they? Well, the first one we see in the New Testament is that that the temple points to God's people who have the Spirit of God in them. The New Testament shows a spiritual temple in God's people from all nations. We see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, chapter 6, verse 19, other passages as well. That's the first reality that the temple points to. The second reality, though, the temple also points to the new creation which the Lord's presence will fill. In Revelations 21, we see a city filled with God's presence. And it says, for its temple is the Lord. That's the temple of the new creation, the Lord. His presence, it is there. And finally, there is a final reality that the temple points to. It points to the body of Jesus. Jesus spoke of his body as a temple. John chapter 2, verse 19 to 21 says this, Jesus said, Destroy this temple, 
and in three days I will raise it up. He was speaking about the temple of his body. The Pharisees thought he's talking about this physical temple right in front of them. But no, he was speaking about the temple of his body. And we now, we now as Christians, experience the presence of God through Christ because he became flesh. He dwelt amongst us. And through Jesus, we are now able to meet with God because through his death and sacrifice, the temple curtain was torn in two when he died. We have gained access into God's full presence for all eternity through the sacrifice of Christ. And this is why Haggai chapter 2, verse 9 concludes saying that in this place, in this greater temple, I will grant peace. Because true peace is only found in Jesus, providing access to God. This is how God's people ultimately experience God's presence and peace. Not through a physical temple, but through Christ. It's through Jesus we have reconciliation with God. Because he faced the anger of the Lord on the cross, so that we do not need to be his enemies, but instead we can be made fit to be in his holy presence. This is what Romans 5 says. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we can have peace with God. And we ultimately have it through Christ. That's how we have peace. That's how we have peace. With God. So take heart, Christian. Work, serve, be strong, and do not fear, though discouragements constantly will push up against you. Remember, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you, and He is powerfully working to make your work glorious. And He works through our weakness, He fills what we think is small and insignificant with his glory, and to make it so much greater. He takes what we have done and makes it so much better, working through us in his spirit. He takes those one-to-one meetings that you have and that you do with other Christians to encourage them. He takes those gospel conversations that you have. He takes those teaching moments and disciplined moments you have as a parent with your children. He takes those moments that you have to do good and serve others and he takes those moments and works something glorious in them that bears fruit for his glory. It's amazing. So Christian, look beyond. Look beyond the rubble of today's discouragements to the glorious future that God is doing as you serve him. Look beyond the rubble of today's discouragements to the glorious future work that God is doing in your service. Look beyond as well the sludge of your hardship, the sludge of when you are disheartened. Look beyond it to our shining, glorious future in God's presence. Look beyond the present. Look beyond the now and what you see as you serve. And look beyond to the glorious future of what God is doing. Look beyond what you see now to the glorious future you have in Christ. And with this in mind, with this in mind, courageously serve him. Be strong, work, and do not fear, though discouragements will push against you. Let's pray. O Lord Almighty, The Lord of hosts, we thank you that you are with us. The God who is all-powerful, a God who works by your Spirit in us to transform us, to enable service to you, to cause us to believe in Christ and have peace with you. A great God, you are with us. And may this reality enable service in us. May it give us courage to be strong, to work, and to not fear as we serve you. May your presence transform how we serve you. And we pray, great God, that this week, 
you would cause us to be a people who seek to honor you in all that we do. May we prioritize your work, your kingdom in our lives, not what we long for. And we pray for the season ahead, a time that may be a bit of a time of rebuilding what we once had. We pray that as discouragements come, that you would remind us of these things, that we would be strong, that we would work, that we would not fear, and that we would know you are with us, you are powerful, and you have a glorious future that you are working all things toward. Remind us of these things, we pray. And we pray all of this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Well, may God help you this week and bless you this week to be strong, to serve him, to work, and to not fear as you seek to serve your Savior. God bless.